Somebody going to ask me what I'm doing? No. You don't know. I'm taking a stand. <coughs> and it's time that we take a stand. That was, that was cheap. I'm sorry. I can't believe I did that. I should have told the story. But anyway, I took a stand. Unfortunately, that's the way it was. Too many times. That's the, that's the way so, a lot of people take a stand <laughs> these days. Uh, and that's where we come to in our study of Galatians this morning. Taking a stand. Uh, we taught theology in the first four chapters. And it's become very clear in our minds, at least I hope so. I hope over, he's been founding this over and over again, that we are free from the law. We are free from the pressure to perform for the acceptance of God. We are free to enjoy the unconditional love and the blessings of the Lord. Every message, every verse, so far in the first four chapters of Galatians, the Galatians has talked about the necessity of being free from the law and receiving God's unconditional acceptance. Now we know this in our minds, but it's time to take a stand in our hearts because there are those who would try to convince us, there are those who would try to knock us down, and those who would try to enslave us all over again to their expectations and their legalism. Now you may say, what is all that about? It will become clear to you. You don't have to do anything. You're a saved child of God. You don't have to do anything to please God. You don't have to gain his acceptance. You already have it. You don't have to do things to gain, to get blessings. He's already given it. In Galatians 5.1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Don't let anyone make you a slave again. When you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, your life, you were free from the bonds of sin. Don't get me wrong. I'm not encouraging anyone to sin. God, Paul says, God forbid. If you, know. but that's not that's not his criteria whether he likes you or not. And there are those who want to say you've got to do this, 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 and this, and then God will like you. And it's simply not true. The only thing you must do is ask Him into your heart and to your life as your personal Savior. And all of a sudden, you get, you're one of His. One of His. And you get His richest blessings. There's a guy named Albert Bob Woodfox, he's 69 years old and he spent 43 years in an isolation cell in prison. He had no view of the sky. He was, he was in a six by nine concrete, concrete box, no human contact. And so while taking a walk, men pacing went into to the other. Two months after he was released from Woodfax, he found himself on a beach in Galveston, Texas. And he was with a friend, and he marveled at all the beachgoers. I mean, for 43 years, he saw no one. And they were all on the beach, and he says it was so strange walking on the beach and all these, pe all these people and kids running around. You'd think that he, after 43 years, would be so glad to be out of prison. But here, two months after the state of Louisiana set him free, he said he sometimes wishes he was back in that cell. Say that's crazy. Someone asked him if he missed his life in lockdown, and he replied, Oh, yeah, yeah. Then he explained human beings feel more comfortable in areas where they are secure. In a cell, you have a routine. You pretty much know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. 
But in society, it's difficult. It's a, it's loser. So there are moments when, yeah, I wish I was back in the security of a cell. And I believe, and I'm afraid, that that describes the sentiments of way too many believers that I know. They prefer the security of confinement. They prefer the security of a routine, knowing what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it. They, they prefer the security of rules which define what is acceptable and what is not. We see it all the time. In our ministry on Thursday nights, don't we, Terry? They always go back to what that prison, the prison of addiction. And they always go back to it because it's secure. They know it. Why? It doesn't, it, it makes just as much sense for someone who's been in isolation cell for 43 years to want to go back to that as someone to go back to addiction. But yet they do. Quite frankly, the idea of freedom scares them. So that when they realize that Christ has set them free, they want to go back to solitary confinement again. They want to know the rules. They want to know the regimen. They want to know how we're supposed to live our lives so we won't mess up. So we'll please God. They want to have someone else define the rules of acceptability, telling them what to do and when to do it. There are a lot of folks out there just trying to get back in jail today because they got their three, they got their three meals and they're told what to do when to do it. They don't have to worry. They're stress-free. They don't have to deal with real life. They don't have to deal with freedom. And, there's, and if we just realize how much freedom we have in Christ, it'd be amazing. But we taste the freedom and say, but you know what? I know that sounds good, but I need rules. I need the law to be told what to do. And then we pretend that it pleases God. And that's the only way to please God. My dear friends, if this describes some of you today, please resist the urge. Christ has set you free, so stay free. Stay free from the law. Stay free from the law. Stay free from any scheme that says you must earn God's favor and blessing. Stay free from any system that forces you to conform in order to be accepted. Why? Because such systems rob us of any spiritual vitality. The law bankrupts us spiritually. By the way, I just want to let you know, I'm not talking about speeding laws. I'm not talking about all the other laws of government. I know we're talking spiritual laws here. I don't want everybody to say, my free. No, we're talking spiritual laws here. Okay, that's on tape, right? We got that. I want to make sure that if any of y'all go out, y'all don't blame me for this. Such systems rob us of spiritual vitality, it bankrupts us spiritually, and first of all, it takes away any value that God has for us. Look in verse 2, chapter 5. It says, Indeed I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, God will profit you nothing. Now I must stop here and I need to tell you what the major problem here he was writing about. There are a group of people that were in in the church that were saying, in the Jews, former Jews, and saying that you need to be circumcised in order to please God. Now, I, we're in mixed company, so I am not going to go into the details of that, but if, you're, if you don't have a clue, you ask your parents. Okay? <laughs> but I, but that's, that's, that's the thing. He said, if you say, and say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. When we conform to a legalistic standard, then Christ is no benefit to us. The standard in the day, what, uh, Paul's day, was circumcision. Back then, people were saying 
You have to be circumcised in order for God to accept you. Today, people might say this. You have to go to church every time the doors are open in order for God to accept you. You might have to give a tithe. You might have to be baptized in order for God to accept you. To gain favor with God. And when that happens, then you put yourself in sort of a legalistic bondage. It even goes further than that. Sometimes you, you have to lose weight or dress just right in order to be on God's good side and experience His richest blessings. Don't make God mad at you. You want to be blessed, you need to do good. There is nothing wrong with some of these things except when they become conditions for acceptance and favor with God. Then they become a source of legalistic bondage, which ignores the work that Christ did on that cross. When you say, when you say, I know Christ died for me and I know I'm free, but I still got to please him, I still got to do this, this, and this. What you've done is you have downgraded what the value of what Christ did on the cross for us. The law takes away any value that Christ has for us. More than that, the law puts us in great debt. If we insist on keeping the part of the law to find acceptance, then we have to keep the whole thing. Look at chapter verse 3. He says, And I testify again to every man who becomes that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. In other words, you just can't pick and choose what part of the law you want to, want to keep. The law is not a buffet. You cannot pick and choose the parts you like and leave the rest. If you're going to insist on circumcision being part of your uh, being part of your plan to keep the for God to, you know, well you better keep the hundred the other six hundred and twelve laws. Alright? It's not a it, 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 it's either you, you got to either or. I mean, you can't just pick and choose which ones. And if you're going to insist on keeping the Sabbath, then you better keep the sacrifices too. Put yourself under the law obligates you to all the law. Try this next time that you stop by a policeman for speeding. Not that that would ever happen. But the next time you stop speeding and you say, Officer, I'm sorry for speeding. But I've never robbed anyone. I've never hurt anybody. I've never... Uh, I've stopped at every stoplight in town. Do you think that's going to get you out of a ticket? And this may be the only time, the only time that you've ever drove over the speed limit. <laughs> that's silly, but, but... But it may be the only time you've driven over, over the speed limit and you get stopped and you say, but officer, I thought all They already have it. 
And they're working constantly to get something that they already have. Don't do it. Stay free from the law because it'll bankrupt you. It'll bankrupt you spiritually. You know, we're going to have to trust God to take care of us. When there's no rules, when we're falling away, we're going to have to have him rescue us. He said, well, I'll just get my act together. No, it's not like that. It's like when we drift away. We have to say, Lord, here I am. Come get me. Him. Even if you even if you try, you just have to give it to him instead of no rest. Trying to keep the rules in our own strength never works to make us better people. It doesn't. Trying to keep the, keep the law, the rules in our own strength never works. To, instead, it leads to spiritually bankrupt. On the other hand, faith enriches us. Depending on Christ makes us spiritually rich. First off. Faith gives us the hope of future blessings. Trust in Christ gives us the assurance we'll be like Him someday. Look at verse 5. It says, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We through the Spirit eagerly await. Await for this hope. I want you to notice something here. Why didn't He put work? <laughs> now look how this would read. For we through the Spirit eagerly work for the hope of righteousness by faith. He didn't put that there, did he? I can tell you, that work's not anywhere found in the Greek, period. It means wait, not work. We are, through the Spirit, we should be waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith. Not our righteousness. We're not working for it to, to make ourselves better. No. God's the only one that can make us righteous. One of his sermons, uh, Gordon Johnson, he said, uh, about, talk about a lady who loved flowers and she planted a rare vine against a stone wall near the back of her yard. She nurtured it and it grew well. It was vigorous. It was beautiful, but it had no blossoms on it. She was disappointed. Then one day she stood there looking at the vine with this beautiful foliage but no blossoms. Her neighbor said, come over to the other side of the wall. She went over to her yard and guess what? That vine had grown through the wall and all the blossoms were on the other side of the wall. She planted over here, but all the good stuff was over here. And that's the way faith is. It leads beyond man's limitations on this side. We're not going to see all the beautiful blossoms that we planted by faith in our hearts and our lives on this side. We'll, we'll see most of them on the other side. But our faith gives that hope. You know, the law could never give us that kind of hope. Following all those rules never would give us. We fail so much that when we try to keep the rules that we know that we'll never be even have as good as Christ. But when we trust Christ and depend on His power, then we have the same the assurance that one day, one day, we will be every good as, a bit as good as Christ. But the law leaves us feeling helpless, ever, never reaching perfection. You ever get frustrated because you're trying to do something? When's 
is the last time you've experienced any kind of love involved? There is no love involved. It's black and white. Either you did it or you don't. You're the penalty for it. It's black and white. There is no grace. There is no mercy. There is no love and law. But in Christ, by putting your faith and your trust and your hope in Christ, it's love. Neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything. Keeping the law or not keeping the law contributes nothing towards our spiritual growth. The law cannot make us righteous. It can, but it, let me tell you what it can do. And here's the problem. The law can make us critical. The law can make us judgmental. Especially when others fail to meet our standards. The law can even make us hypocritical. But the law cannot make us holy. And the law cannot make us loving. Only faith can do that. And only a faith with ex which expresses itself through love. So don't let the law bankrupt you. Live your life in dependence upon the Lord and be enriched with a hope for the future and love in the present. Take a stand today against the enemies of freedom. How? Well, put your trust in Christ and stay free from the law. Then it gets personal. Stay free from the legalist as well. Those people who are always looking for for the rules and, and the regulations saying you got to do it, you can't wear that, you can't do that, and you can't do that. God will be happy. They're all over our churches. Some more than others. This is important. I want you to, I want you to stay, if you stay away from any preacher that tells you God's bless, blessings are conditioned on something you Keep away from any teacher that tells you you are not good enough for God. But if you do so and so, God will bless you. But you're right now, you're just not good enough for God. Run away from any so-called holy man or woman that tells you you have to earn God's favor or blessing. Or put it as Paul put it in the next verse. Don't let anybody cut you off. You ran well. He tells them who hindered you from obeying the truth. This persuasion does not come from Him who calls you. God called you to a life of faith, not to a life of frustration. I'm trying to keep somebody's love. Someone's tripped these believers up. And he's, Paul goes, who's done this to you? This is not the way we, I taught you. This is not the way you knew. Someone has come in your midst and began telling you these lies about the law. Stay away from the legalists. Don't let them cut you know. Don't let them contaminate you. The next verse in five, chapter 9 it says, A little leaven let us a whole lump. I have heard this all my life growing up from Pharisees, apparently. I believe it. One of the things we do when we start to actually study the Bible is understand the context in which something is said. What's the context? The whole book of Galatians is not just, it's about the law. And now he's talking about those in, who, the people inside the church who was teaching this. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now back, in the, the Jews believed that leaven was evil, was a symbol of evil. I love it today because you know what it does? It makes that bread dry. But that's the idea, is that once something gets in. I've heard, I've heard this said from the pulpit, I don't have any time. Man, if you have just a little bit of sin in your church, it's going to grow and fester because a little leaven. Let, let, let us the whole lump. Well, listen, if that's the case, we're all doomed anyway. Because we're all sinners. We all got issues. We all got problems. None of us are sinners. So what is he talking about? He is talking about that one. That one, two, three people in that church who was going around saying, you've got to be circumcised. If you're going to get right with God, you've got to be circumcised. 
you want to get right with God, you need to come to church. You need to come to Sunday school every time. If you want to get right with God, then you need to give your offerings. If you want to get right with God, you need to stop your wicked ways. Let me tell you something. We're all wicked. We all got, we're all part of that letter. That's not what he's talking about. He is talking about those spirits. He's talking about those Judaizers. And that's the context. Not whether or not we all got little sins or not, and it's going to grow. He's talking about these people who were teaching him them these things. Galatians 5.10. It says, I have confidence in you, talking to Galatians, in the Lord that you will have no other mind, that he that troubles you shall bear his judgment wherever he is. God will judge the legalist who troubles the people. He'll judge those who complicate the gospel with additional rules, rituals, and regulations. Because that's what the uh, legalists did in Paul's day. They were trying to make it sound like Paul was endorsing circumcision. But he said, verse 11, uh, verse 10, uh, verse 11, I'm sorry. He said, verse 11, And I, brother, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. He says, all right, if I'm preaching circumcision, then how come they're still persecuting me? See, Paul had taught that the cross was sufficient to secure our righteousness and that the only thing necessary was faith. Working through love. <clears throat> For the legalists in Paul's day, Paul's day had complicated this simple gospel message. With all kinds of additional rules and regulations, and they're still doing it today. There are all kinds of teachers on the radio and TV who make God's blessings conditional. If you'll send me $25 as a love offering, then you'll get this blessing back. Hopefully you don't fall for that. God's blessings are not conditioned whether you give money or not. Please, don't let them cut it. Don't let them contaminate you. Don't let them confuse you. Now, we're about to wind this up. You think that it's okay you to have people in your church who believe in believers who want to deny the blessings of God and that you're trying to, you know, please in Him. And along with these Pharisees and these legalists there comes a whole lot of negative, bad things that happen in churches. Do you think that's okay? Let me share you with you what situations like the I wish that those who trouble you would even would even cut themselves off. The ESV version says emasculate. Let me give you just a moment. And I will not go into detail. But let me give you a moment. What they were saying is that the cutting, the mutilation of circumcision, if the Jews believed it was righteous, it get made you righteous. You know what he's saying here? Well, just think what would happen, how righteous you'd be if you cut everything off. Sorry, Paul said it, not me. This is serious. In the Greek time, people would make themselves eunuchs, and they would think that they were truly holy, and the Jews would just cut them apart, and... Paul just says, if you really think it makes you righteous, then go ahead and cut all of it. He's saying. How many times did Jesus say, woe unto you, you Pharisees and you scribes? What were they? The ultimate of legalists. Because they wanted to follow the law. They wanted to follow the rules and thought that the rules would make them holy. You cannot be holy without Jesus Christ on you, in you, on the inside, coming from you. and makes you holy. There's not a thing that you can do in this life that will make you holy. That will please God. Until you ask Him into your heart, into 
your life. He said, Lord, save me. At that point in time, He comes in, enters your life, Five, four, ten. Five, four, ten. 